In this video, I'm going to share specific strategies I used to get a shorter federal prison sentence. I hope just one of these strategies helps you. I hope two or three of them help you. But if just one of these strategies help you, it's worth the time you're allocating to watch to watch this video and, and subscribe to White Collar Advice. And as I like to say, I know this is a very difficult, I shouldn't say like to say, as I've said before, I know it's a very difficult experience and I hope you have found a home here at White Collar Advice and you find a lot of value in our work and you continue to find value in our work. So I'm gonna jump right in with some of these strategies. And in each strategy, I'm gonna share the pro and con to following these, these strategy because of every decision we make, comes with a consequence. And I want you to understand that before you just dive in and say, because Justin said to do it, I'm going to do it. Exercise your own judgment. Think about it, write it out, and take immediate incremental daily action. Here's the shameless plug for lessons from prison. Probably the most profound lesson I learned in prison, which I learned it before I went to prison, was the good old tortoise and the hare fable, the idea that slow and steady wins the race. Well, that's similar to preparing for sentencing. So I would argue the first strategy that I used was working. I lost my job in January 2005 as a stockbroker. Shouldn't say lost. I was fired for decisions that ultimately sent me to, to federal prison in April 2008. And I had to work uh, both to, to pay the lawyers and to continue to pay my bills. But my case went on for three years. And during that time, I worked uh, aggressively. Now, I made a lot of bad decisions in my life. In Lessons from Prison, we write about going to In-N-Out Burger and putting on weight and playing online chess and sort of the self-loathing. The nights were very difficult for me with the weight of the day behind me, sitting at home thinking about how my life was imploding. But during the day, I was very proactive. So the first strategy for all of you is work. Why? White collar crime investigations can take a long time to play out. So besides the money that you'll need in feeling productive, Working provides a wonderful opportunity to begin creating a new record as a law-abiding citizen. So beyond the money and all the other benefits, you can demonstrate and work to create a new record. The longer this goes on, the better. Our team is frequently asked, if my case has been delayed three or six months, is that a good thing? The answer is it depends on how you're using your time. So using that three-year window to work and building a record was really significant in front of the government, my probation officer the prosecutor, and my judge because I was able to make decisions that showed I was getting further away from my past. So the pros are building a new record and demonstrating that um, we can become better. Well, what is the con? I said a moment ago, all of these videos are going to have pros and cons. The cons for, for some people looking to work before prison include you may have to find a job that is beneath your skill set. I was fortunate, I will acknowledge, to be able to sell real estate in Calabasas at Sotheby's for several years. My longtime close friend and business partner, Sam Pompeo, offered me a job and the real estate market was booming. I recognize not everyone's gonna have a friend willing to let them come into their real estate practice. So you may have to find a job right now that is beneath your skill set. You may have to find a job that pays you less than you are used to earning. So the pro I just described, the con is it may be humbling. In some cases, it may be embarrassing. I shared the example of a client of ours, a physician in New York who drives for Lyft during the day, delivers food for DoorDash in the evening. This guy was a big time physician earning nearly a million dollars a year, yet he's humbled himself to do work to help support a family, but demonstrate that he can create a new record. So I want you to think about the pros and cons of working, but there is no doubt it helped mitigate my prison sentence. If you work and if you document it properly, it will help you get a shorter prison sentence too. Let's transition to the, the second one, working openly with government investigators. Now, as articulated in Lessons from Prison, Paul Bertrand showed up to my home April 28, 2005. Paul Bertrand was the FBI agent that arrested me, and I lied during that interview. And that lie eventually led to the recommendation of an indictment. I wasn't ready to speak openly about my conduct, though in time I was given a second chance at veracity after my co-defendant got indicted on new charges. The government came back to me and said, we're gonna give you one more chance to tell the truth. Now, unfortunately, at that time, because, my, because I lied to the government, I didn't have a chance of this coveted 5K1. All of you watching this, a huge strategy, probably the best nugget or tool you have to get a shorter federal prison sentence is to obtain this coveted 5K1 letter. Yet, that yes, requires active and ongoing cooperation against other defendants. And I understand many of you principally would never cooperate. Many say, my goal is to get home as quickly as possible. 
I did not have a chance to get this coveted 5K1 letter because um, I forfeited that right by line initially. So when they came back to me, they said, you're not going to work with the Department of Justice. We want you to sit with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And it was Cindy Nixon and Bob Tessero from the SEC where I allocated 100 hours in the year in advance of my sentencing, helping them understand the corporate culture at UBS that enabled this. So here's the strategy and why it ended up mitigating my sentence in so many ways. Speaking openly and honestly with government investigators about my conduct helped them understand why I did what I did, how I was swept in to this conduct, my actual role. How many people sign a plea agreement or if you've been sentenced feel like the government didn't accurately portray your role and who you are and what you did? So by spending 100 hours with them, it helped them really ascertain who I was. A huge benefit to meeting with government investigators, which is why if, if you're ready to proffer, you should, presuming you're ready to speak openly and honestly about your role, if you're prepared to tell your story. The, the reason it was so impactful was because by telling the story, UBS, my former employer, was indirectly swept into my conduct. Now, you can't put a corporation in jail, of course, but the losses were around $9 million initially. And initially, I was looking at a $9 million restitution number. Yet by speaking openly and honestly with the Securities Exchange Commission and having them being able to vet and verify, which they do via email and text and internal documents, vetting everything I said, they found that UBS was complicit in this conduct. Hence, UBS wrote a check for $8.5 million dollars to the victims, that brought down my sentencing guidelines, that brought down the total loss amount. In time, all the victims were paid back. I was hit with a half a million dollars in restitution that I think went to the United States Treasury. But by speaking openly with the government, I was able to really bring down the guidelines and bring in, I hate to say bring in, just tell the truth. And UBS was found to be complicit, which they were. The con to spending 100 hours with the, the government it was expensive. <laughs> I made a mistake when I was when I signed my plea when I signed the retainer agreement with the law firm. It only covered my government, my criminal investigation. I didn't read the plea. I didn't read the retainer really. I didn't really. I read it, but I didn't understand it. I'd never been through it before. It was my first time. I'd have signed anything they put in front of me. I was so scared to go to prison. And they they did. They were ethical. They did the right thing. But I presumed when I began working, meeting with the SEC, that it was covered. Instead, my lawyer said, send me another 50. It doesn't cover civil investigations. So the con was it was very expensive over that year to meet with the government. Two lawyers side by side at 500 bucks an hour. That was a six-figure investment. Another con is you, you have to humble yourself. You've got to be deferential. You've got to invest the time to tell your story properly. I really began to invest the time and really un tried to understand how and why. I ended up here. Not everyone wants to do that. Some people, unfortunately, are lazy or they talk about preparing. They don't actually want to do it. So if you do have an opportunity to meet with the Department of Justice, potentially to get that 5K1 or the Security and Exchange Commission in a civil government investigation, you've got to understand that the pros and cons. And a lot of people say they want it. Uh, they don't actually do it. A third strategy I use to get a shorter federal prison sentence, a community service. I actually did the work <laughs> and I share this because uh, some people who pursue community service in advance of sentencing, it's very opportunistic and they're not looking to create a win-win. I'm not saying it should be all altruistic where it's only about other people and I derive no benefit from this. It should absolutely be a win-win. But judges are very smart as are prosecutors. They're the judges appointed by a sitting president. So it makes sense that you understand in this, the stakeholders, their perception of you, that they're gonna be cynical. They're gonna expect you to say something because you want a certain outcome. So it's important with community service that it's documented, preferably over a lengthy period of time. And rather than go to the soup kitchen once a month and post it on Facebook as if you're some hero, and I'm not saying that's not noble, it makes more sense to have community service work that is very specific and measurable. Community service work where you can demonstrate how the work helped people and how it will continue to help people and get letters or evidence that the community service actually helped people. That was the case with me. I'll put up a link to characterletters.com where you can enroll in a, few, a free character reference course we have. And in there, you will see a letter from the community service organization I volunteer to. And you will see the length of the volunteer work, the time. And I was authentic. I actually did it rather than, wow, I get sentenced in two days. Let's claim that I've changed the world. So it is certainly a mitigating factor. It helped me, the community service. The con is you actually have to do the work. The con is you actually have to invest the time 
put in the sweat equity or create some process that demonstrates how you're helping people. And again, this comes back to some people saying they want it. Are you actually willing to, to follow through? What are you willing to struggle for? There were days I did not want to work, I assure you. There were days it was 110 degrees in Los Angeles on a Sunday. I had a court date that Monday. I had to go show property for seven hours. I was miserable and depressed and didn't want to do it. Yet when I got out of the house and I was working, I felt better because I was active. Same thing with community service. There are days I did not want to do it, yet I struggled through it, both because I had to feel productive, but I also knew in the back of my mind this could help me at sentencing. Again, a win-win, never claiming to be totally altruistic. So a strategy you can use, presuming it's for the right reasons, and you can document how you're helping people absolutely is community service. Now, another strategy that helped me immensely at sentencing was a very solid probation interview. Many of you know, sometimes I ramble I don't know when to shut up. I'm sorry. I'm always trying to do better. The rambling, however, because I had the right message in the probation interview really helped me. It helped me a great deal. Some people have probation interviews that are 12 minutes or 15 minutes. How can a cynical bureaucrat whose job is usually to parrot what the government has told them learn about your life in a 15 minute interview? They cannot. How many of you, when asked about the background, well, my background was good? Oh, okay, that's it. That's all you have to say. I seized opportunities to demonstrate my background, what I'm doing for work, what the plans are for the rest of my life. All of that made its way into the report. Specific example, during the probation interview, the probation officer saw that I lived, in, I grew up in Encino, which is a wealthy, very nice area. And it was a little smirky the way she said it, like, oh, Encino, huh? I sensed that as an opportunity. So I said, may I tell you a story about Encino? She said, yes. I said, I'm the only one in my family to date that's graduated college. My father owns a hardware store. He drives to work every day with a red shirt that says Bernie on it. He owns the store, the business, yes, but he owns a hardware store. My mom's a paralegal. I remember her working full days, all long days as a paralegal, putting my brother and me to bed and driving to the USC paralegal program from six to 10 at night, four nights a week, and then getting us up the next day and sending us off to school and doing it again. My parents worked so hard to provide for us. Neither of them graduated college. My father jokes that had he bought the home in Encino a year earlier, he never could have afforded it. He just got lucky buying the house there. And I've embarrassed and I've ashamed them and, and I'm sorry and I wanna do better. That story about Encino was honest. It gave them some details about my parents and a better understanding of how we ended up in this very wealthy neighborhood kind of by luck. My dad bought the home in the 60s when a lot of people were moving from Brentwood and West LA to the Valley, which is what my parents did. But she appreciated that, learning about my parents rather than, oh yeah, uh, here's another privileged guy in front of me, the hills of Encino, living next to doctors, lawyers, and judges, which we did. That helped, helped her see me differently. My probation interview, she got a sense of I think the real shame that I felt, but most importantly, I think it was my background and what the plans were for the rest of my life. And I told her in that interview, I'd hope to continue to sell real estate despite my conviction. And unfortunately, I lost my license. Now the con to the probation interview, it may require you to say some things you may not feel. For example, you may not really feel remorse today. You may not feel ashamed for your conduct. You may feel if you signed a plea agreement that you were railroaded or forced to sign it. You need to look at this experience like a business deal. Some business deals suck, you just need to complete them. In order to complete them, it may require you to say and do some things you may not agree with at the moment, but it also requires you to identify your value system. If your value system or the highest value is freedom and family, it may require you to learn and practice and convey a level of remorse and shame in that interview you may not feel because of its boilerplate or I'm sorry, or they think you're such a sorry because you got caught, or if you're attempting to have your cake and eat it too, I did it however, I did it but I felt pressure. You're not going to get the, it may make you feel better because you're not fully coming clean, but it's not gonna get you to that highest value, which is what? the shortest sentence in the most favorable institution. Again, the pros and cons of every action here. These strategies worked really well for me. They work well for our clients as they prepare for, for sentencing. So let's continue along with strategies I use to get a great outcome. I held my lawyers accountable. 
I did not allow them to turn in boilerplate information. I was very invested in the process because I learned. Initially, I retained the law firm Jones Day, flush money down the toilet. When I retained Jones Day, I told them that UBS, my former company, was complicit. They disagreed. Nothing happened for many months until Jones Day called to tell me they represented UBS in a similar matter, which makes sense considering it's Jones Day, one of the biggest law firms in the world, and UBS is a billion dollar bank. They called to say, we're conflicted. We can no longer represent you. I said, well, I told you when I hired you, UBS was involved. They said, we didn't believe you. And now the government believes UBS is complicit. We're conflicted. We have to fire you. I said, get my money back. They said, no chance. Ultimately, I did. It took years. So I went to a new law firm and I told them, this is not going to happen again where I get railroaded by law firms, where I feel exploited and I'm vulnerable. I buy into the buzzwords and not a damn thing happens. I'm out six figures right now and I am no further to a better outcome. So what I did because I was burned was learn to hold my lawyer accountable on the fly as best I possibly could by meetings and calls and demanding weekly and biweekly status updates and reports and things of that nature. For that reason, the sentencing memorandum that was turned in was not boilerplate. In fact, it was freaking fantastic. Joel Athey, the lawyer with whom I've sent many clients, wrote a fantastic sentencing memorandum. Not because he's a good writer, which he is. It wasn't boilerplate. He took my narrative, my letters. He built them into a beautiful story that really got past the boilerplate templated stuff judges see 85 million times. And to their credit, they wanted me involved. They demanded that I was involved. They held me accountable. I had great lawyers after the bad go around with Jones Day. So what helped me get a shorter sentence was holding the lawyer accountable, writing, a, I think, a very compelling first person narrative that made its way into the probation report by luck. Uh, that made its way to the sentencing judge, Judge Wilson, who appreciated it, made its way to the government investigators. Again, once I had this narrative or this content created, we disseminated it to all the stakeholders. It does no good. I said, like, you know, having a book, it does no good if it sits in the garage or in the back of my trunk. That's useless. Use it. I began to use it. The con to holding your lawyers accountable. Some, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes lawyers don't want to be held accountable. Some lawyers don't welcome or value your feedback. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, especially if your personality may be to cower or you don't like confrontation or you don't want to ruffle feathers. In order for you got to embrace some things that are uncomfortable for you, you have to embrace some uncomfortable truths because I, I think real leadership entails not running from responsibility, not invading of what's in front of you, not kicking it off to the side and say, I'll deal with it another day. Deal with it right now. This is your life. Your lawyers are going to have good lawyers. They're going to have hundreds of cases in their life. This is your only case. No one should be more vested than you. And that requires tough conversations, asking questions, and demanding uh, accountability. And that's something that I, because I was burned by Jones Day, and I've worked with Jones Day since with great, you know, but it was those specific lawyers, I think, that didn't have my best interest. And I want you to learn from that. I want you to hold these lawyers accountable. The sixth strategy that really helped me at sentencing was excellent character reference letters. Again, I'm going to put up a link to characterletters.com. It's a free character reference course that you can go through where I give specific examples of my letters and why they were solid, along with templates and things that you can learn from as you look. I hate to use the word template because it sounds boilerplate. Examples of what great character reference letters look like. So character reference letters really helped me. And part of that strategy included understanding my judge, Judge Wilson. Thanks in part to my lawyers, I knew Judge Wilson favored brevity. So I had 16 character reference letters. I only turned in six. I did not turn in a letter from my mom or dad or brother. I did not turn in letters from people who may have known me for 20 or 30 years because I had those elsewhere. I focused on coming back to the first point. Remember I said I worked, which was a huge mitigated strategy for me. I turned in a letter from my broker. I turned in a letter from a client who articulated in a letter that advice I gave him cost me money, but it was in his best interest. See, that comes back to point number one, creating a new record as a law-abiding citizen. So it was very strategic to get 16 great letters, but only turned in six. And again, they spoke to my character and that I was making better decisions. So all of you need to compile character reference letters that are not boilerplate, that are not templated, that speak to your character, that are authentic. I don't care if it's from a, a senator or a congressman or a celebrity. Nobody cares. As Judge Bennett told us, I don't care if it's your gardener, plumber, electrician, or best friend. Anyone that can speak to your character. I compiled letters. The con to this is 
you actually have to reach out to your network. You have to speak openly about your conduct or what it is that you're going through. And there have been some people that have said to me, well, I don't want to bother people. And I don't want to bring people into what I'm doing right now. It's not their business. And of course, that's a cop out. That is an excuse. You don't have to pick up the phone and say, I made some really bad decisions. And rather than run from this, I'd be grateful if we could spend a few minutes together. And you can learn what I've learned, what I'm doing differently, how I'm making amends, because people have been hurt through my actions. And I know this is the first time you've received a call from a friend of yours who's in trouble or may go to prison, uh, but I'm humbly asking for your help. Right? You can do that in a million different ways, but that requires you making the phone call. That requires you sending an email to ask for a cup of coffee. That requires you to invest the time. But in so doing, you're nurturing and growing your network. In so doing, you're learning to tell your story. And that even comes back to you know these points of lawyers who say, oh, the guidelines are the guidelines. There's nothing you can do that's even better and you're not going to, to get any lower and what's the point of preparing? Even if you do all of this work, even if you follow every strategy I'm talking about in this video, and even if you get a guideline sentence and you think that guy Justin on YouTube from White Collar Advice is trash and garbage because I did everything he told me to do and I still got a guideline sentence, which can happen, which does happen, of course. What's the upside? You've been working. You're developing your network by character reference letters. You're holding lawyers accountable. You're doing community service. There's so many benefits, even if God forbid you get a guideline sentence, right? Even if you get a guideline sentence and you have a phenomenal probation interview, it can impact your job, your bunk, early release, probation. Everything you do matters, even if God forbid you to get a guideline sentence. The seventh and final point in this video, paying back the money. This one is a very delicate situation because a lot of lawyers will say, You're, my only job is to keep you out of prison. That's a good job. You want a lawyer who feels like their job is to keep you out of prison. I really like those lawyers. Hire more of those lawyers. But sometimes when they say that, they may compel you or convince you to part with every last penny you have. And in so doing, you go totally broke and you still kind of get a, the same prison sentence, right? If you have a guideline range of 18 to 24 months, a year and a day, 30 months, 37 months, especially, especially with you know the early release program, we have a client that just got 37 months, home in 10 months, another client 33 months, home in 10 months, another client 24 months, home in 10 months. All of these case studies we document, we film video with our, most a lot of our clients. In the end, you know, they were going to get the same outcome whether they parted with the cash or not. So I cert it helped me pay back $100,000 at sentencing, though as I filmed in a separate video, I'll put a link to pros and cons of making a restitution payment before sentencing. I regretted, <laughs> I regretted parting with $100,000 because I think it bought me six months out of jail, but I was 33. I wasn't married. I didn't have children. Time in a minimum security camp working alongside my partner, Michael Santos, was relatively easy. I could have used the resources when I came home. So certainly it can lead to a shorter prison sentence, but not always. I know of defendants who have turned over nine and $10 million and still gotten eight or nine years in federal prison. Some judges may think you rob a bank, you pay the money back, you still robbed a bank. I'm not treating you differently because you paid the money back, plus you have it, but in so doing, some dudes go totally broke and they're reaching out to people to get $200 a month in commissary. So I want you to be very careful about I want you to assess and analyze. Is it in your interest to make a payment? I don't think token payments are that healthy. You're worth a million bucks. You send in 15 grand. It's really got to be significant. And if you do it, you really want to show how it's creating heartache and stress and struggle, which it probably will. I know it did for me. The con is you actually have to come up with the money. The con is it could really impact your lifestyle in prison and when you come home. So like everything else, what are the pros of making the payment? Is it worth six months or a year out of jail knowing it may not help? at all. Some people think I'm insane and crazy. Um, that's a different conversation, <laughs> I suppose. Some people thought I was insane and crazy when I mentioned I wish I had that $100,000 back. I'd have probably done an extra few months in jail. You've got to use your own judgment. You've got to determine what makes the most sense for you. And if you're in a position to make a payment, I just want you to understand the pros and cons of, of making that. But I can tell you in my case, I know given 100 grand absolutely led to a shorter federal prison sentence. So here we are. I filmed this video, seven strategies that helped me mitigate my prison sentence. I hope all of them help you. But even if one of them helps you, your time and my time has been used 
properly. Thank you so much for watching this video. Of course, subscribe if you find value. Lastly, I'm going to say Ethics in Motion, which is a book that my colleague and I, Michael Santos, wrote many, many years ago. It can really help you learn about ethics and white collar crime, the pressures you faced and how you can articulate your story and life and background. So I'm putting every chapter to Ethics in Motion up on the White Collar Advice site, 16 standalone chapters about ethics and fraud and white collar crime. I'll put up a link to the Ethics in Motion page in this description. Until I see you again, thank you for your interest and I wish all of you success as you traverse this very difficult experience. Goodbye.